Welcome to Sex, Love, and Relationships. My name is Naya, and I'm here with a couple who has blown me away. They give godly wisdom about some tough topics. We have John and Helen Burns here. John and Helen are a wealth of knowledge when it comes to relationships. They've had their own radio and television show for years. They're authors of award-winning and best-selling relationship books and have been helping singles and couples navigate through life for over 30 years. Today we interview a couple who have some outstanding advice on how to keep healthy boundaries before marriage. Like I've heard people say like, it's a direction that you choose to take. And I was like, I think that's full of BS basically. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Also coming up in the show, we have John and Helen taking some real life questions from our studio audience. Such well, that a, is a loaded a question. question. We've sure walked through this. Yeah, I, I think financial pressure is one of the worst pressure there is. And we head to social media to see what's trending online. And I know you want him to see you, but he hasn't seen your face yet. I think it's become so normal in this selfie world that it's like, well, it's just a picture and he won't show it to anybody else. And it's okay. It's not like we're having sex or anything. Yeah. I just showed him a picture of my breasts. Mm -hmm. This show covers all of the hard-hitting topics we need godly wisdom on. You don't want to miss this. So today's topic is healthy boundaries for adults. So that includes boundaries in arguments and in sex. I got the experts here. Let's talk to them. <laughs> yes, John, Helen, welcome. Oh, Thanks. it's great to be here. Oh, it's yes. great to be here. What a great topic. Yes. Boundaries. You healthy know, boundaries. Yeah, healthy boundaries. I think, I think sometimes it's better to know what you won't do mm. <laughs> because it really clarifies what you will do. Wow. And yet boundaries is kind of like the guardrails on, on a road that keep yeah. you from going in the ditch. So but I don't know about you, I've never hit a guardrail. Wow. <laughs> I usually want to stay on the road. Come on. You know, the, the key is stay on the road, and we've got some great things today. Come I think on. that'll help us. And I love that it's around our sexuality. It's also mm -hmm. around having healthy communication. Because when you know, it, it's about how you will let someone treat you and how you treat others. And I think this information is going to be hugely helpful. I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Now, earlier this week, Helen caught up with a gentleman who has mastered the art of healthy boundaries in his relationship. Let's take a look. Hello, Alex. Welcome to the program. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, so my goal today is to just, in this segment, get to hear a little bit more about who you are and some of your story. We're talking today about healthy boundaries yeah. and relationships, but why don't you tell us a little bit about you? So I, I lived in Miami most of my life. Um, my parents are Cuban-American, uh, both believers. Um, grew up in the church. My mom was my Sunday school teacher, mm. so... Got to hear all the, the Bible verses and nursery songs and all that. And she um, she really, like, poured into us a lot when we were kids. So she would always, like, read the Bible for us. And then we would have songs in Spanish that she would sing to us mm -hmm. that we would, like, almost like memory verses, but in Spanish. Beautiful. So she invested a lot in us. Um, then life got a little bit difficult once I got into my senior year of high school. So my parents uh, unfortunately got divorced. When I was in high school, and um, that's a life-altering. It crisis. was. It was because if you think, you know, you have um, it's a tough age being 17 and trying to figure life out, yeah. and um, to have something like that happen, it just increases all of the questions and yeah. the doubts and everything. Yeah. So, for me, it was just like at that point in time, I was like, I felt like God had abandoned me, yeah. so I was going to abandon Him. So. At that point, I realized that I had a lot of pain and I didn't want to deal with the pain and I didn't want to deal with, you know, answering questions as to why did God have my parents get divorced. So I decided that I had a free card to kind of go and do as I please and I was not, you know, responsible for my actions because, you know, if God took something away from me, then I can just go on and do what, whatever I want. So would you say that was just kind of an anger on the inside of you acting out? Did you not have a sense during that of like, I don't know what, I, what I'm doing, like, why am I doing this? Or did you just feel like it was a license? Um, what was happening too is, you know, getting into also the topic of healthy boundaries, I didn't have a great support system, a good Christian support yeah. system around me to yeah. kind of 
lean on a little bit and say, hey, you know, like, for instance, now if something were to happen, I know that I can go to certain people and say, hey, I'm really struggling with this. Can you help me out? So I felt like I was by myself. So what I was doing was I was growing up in my 20s, figuring out how to be a man all by myself. Wow. According to the world standards. Yeah. Because my father was, I, we still have a relationship, but even back then, he was going through his own issues. I was going through my own issues. So, you know, my brother and I, we had to grow up in our 20s kind of figuring out how to be men, let alone men of God, which mm -hmm. is two totally different things. Yeah. Um, all by ourselves. Right. So what filled that gap for you? When did you kind of come to terms um, with, with this big challenge in your life and feeling a little isolated, abandoned, and alone? So there was a few moments where God responded in a mighty way. So like I said, I pulled away from God and I started figuring things out on my own. And, you know, I was in a really bad relationship at the time. And I prayed one night. I was like, God, you know what? If, if you don't want us to be together, then you need to just express that to me somehow some way deliver that message that we're that this is done that mm -hmm. i need to start moving away so it was raining one night in miami and i was driving to go see this um the person i was dating and the road was really slick and wet and i lost control i had an suv at the time I lost control of my car i hopped over a median and i slid so i was i got onto like almost where oncoming traffic would be except yeah. there were no cars on the road so wow. I kind of had just a moment there where I was like, okay, I remember the prayer that I made. Mm -hmm. I just witnessed what happened. Luckily, thank God, like there were no cars on the road mm -hmm. for otherwise I might not even be here yeah, right now. No kidding. And I just realized in that moment, I was like, wow, this, this is what people, when people ask for signs and they ask for God to respond mm -hmm. to them, this is one of those moments. So God showed you, he protected you in that moment, but from there then, you had to make a choice. Absolutely, so continuing then with what I was dealing with with a divorce, I realized after that moment that I needed help because I was going through such depression that I didn't feel as if like I could even be myself around my own family, around my own friends. I didn't even recognize who I was, you know, around my family and friends. So I decided to go see a therapist and she recommended volunteer work, which oh. the reason she said that was, you know, you need to start pouring in to other people so that you can be fed. Yep. Found out afterwards that the therapist was Christian the whole time mm -hmm. and like recommended a book by Joyce Meyer. And I was like, okay, and um, started reading that and then it became a volunteer to Children's Hospital um, mm -hmm. in Miami, which I was there for about seven years. And wow. Yeah, so like what happened when I became a volunteer at Children's Hospital was like I learned almost to love again. I learned that I could trust other people because of the relationship that happened uh, you know, my, my parents' separation, I couldn't trust anyone anymore yeah. because the two people that I trusted more than anyone in the world mm -hmm. now let me down. Yeah. You know, so it's like, it almost gave me carte blanche to kind of say, well, now I can't trust anybody. Right. So volunteering at the hospital really opened my eyes. And um, while I was at the hospital, the second testimony also happened. So again, I was in another relationship and um, I thought I was going to end up marrying this girl that I was dating. And before I ever even had the chance to ask, um, we broke up and um, it was very difficult for me because I was seeking the things that I wanted. Yeah. You know, I was seeking, I never prayed about who God had for me. I never prayed for God to guide my life. I had a plan for my life and God needed to get in line with my plans mm -hmm. in order for me to be happy. It had never had anything to do with his plans for me. It was yeah. always my plans and he needed to agree to my plans. So just giving you a painting the picture of, of what was about to happen. So there I am, I had an engagement ring. I thought that you know I was gonna end up marrying um, this girl that I was really in love with and the relationship ends and I go for a run, right? And I break down in the middle of this run and I go, God, if this is, if, if this is you creating the situation then I need you now more than ever. Mm -hmm. And um, lo and behold, I kept praying, I kept praying and I kept believing and I kept using the becoming a volunteer at the hospital as part yeah. of the testimony. I was like, you know what, if you did it for me back then, you're going to do it again now. And I didn't have that before. So I know it's a good ending. Yeah. I know that the story's fantastic, and I've loved you letting us delve into yeah. yours a little bit. And now we're going to meet with a few others and a very special lady in a yes. new season in your life. So thank you so much yeah. for sharing this, Alex, and I can't wait to continue the story. Absolutely. 
wow, what insight into this emotionally driven part of relationships. Now, after the break, we welcome our guests to the studio to continue this conversation. Stay with us. Welcome back to Sex, Love, and Relationships. Now, we just saw Helen discuss the topic of healthy boundaries with a man who is now joined by his lovely lady in the studio. Let's welcome Alex and Tiffany. Welcome. Good Thank to see you, you guys. You. Good, good to have to you. Here. It's good to be here. So now, Alex, um, we heard a little bit about your story and, you know, just taking us on the journey. You, you've come from a, you know, your parents divorced and you were having trouble kind of navigating the da dating world because right. of that, you know, trusting again right. and... And then you said you were on a journey where you were about to even ask a, another young lady yes. to, you know, to be your wife, but then something happened. God happened. Oh, That's come what on. happened. God happened, to be honest with you. Yes. Yeah, so, um, um, so part of my story was uh, so there was a, an engagement that I thought was going to happen. God had other plans. God then moves me to Los Angeles, gets me a job that I've always dreamed of having, and then at that point I was like, okay. Um, God, if you have the woman for me now that I'm supposed to be with, that would be great too. I mean, if you want to add a little bonus, that would be great. So then he actually challenged me in that area. So he said, you know, if if you're if you are willing to to look and find the woman that I have for you, you need to start doing things that I the way that I need you to do mm. things and yeah. not continue to fall into the same dating habits that have led you wow. to the same results time and time wow, again. Wow, that's wow. big. You know. So that's where boundaries comes in. That's where boundaries come so in. So yes. can I ask you guys and Tiffany can let uh, just ask you, what are some of the boundaries that are absolutes in your relationship? Absolutely. Well, when we first like when we first started dating, I think like our very first date actually, I told him he was my very first kiss. Wow. I grew up in a, um, I grew up Christian. Like I was saved when I was three years old. And then I had this passion within me. Like I have a destiny to fulfill. And if the right man isn't here, then I don't have time to be wasting. I don't have the emotional capacity to take all those setbacks. Cause I was wow. seeing how like friends and family were like getting set back and about how like breakups and about how like it was just, it wasn't good. And so I was like, well, if it's not good or healthy for me to be in a relationship right now, then I'm just gonna keep on going. And I just kept on going. And like, until I had a master's degree in nursing, like I just kept going, <laughs> like, wow. I just kept going. And I uh, finally got to a point where I was like, God, I, I need breakthrough in this area in my life, like badly. Like I was just really feeling it. Like, I'm, I was like begging God, like screaming out at God, I'm like, okay, God, like it is time. And the next thing I knew, like, Alex came and it was like, but it was like God, like, put something in my heart, like, before, like, we ever even went out for the first time or, like, for the first month. Like, there was just something there. I was just like, that God put there that he was like, okay, why, why isn't he on your list? And I was like, I don't know. So I was like, better go find out. <laughs> and so, so then that's what happened. And then, like, I told him, like, I was just, he was my first kiss, and then, like... I freaked out. I was like, really? Did. Okay. He completely freaked out. It was great. <laughs> it was, like, the good freaking out. Yeah. Like, he was just like, what? Like, he thought it was an honor to be someone's first, because he'd never been anyone's I first I was your before. first kiss. Oh. Yeah. She, and she How'd knew that it, work too. Out? It worked out pretty good. <laughs> I didn't have to guess if it was first his first kiss. First and last. Yeah. Yes. Yes. First and last. We won't talk about me, yes. but we, that was his first kiss. <laughs> let me, well, let me ask. You said first kiss, right? Yeah. So now you're coming in, you know, new relationship, you know, mm -hmm. for you, what have you. Now, how do you set boundaries? Do you know to set boundaries? Are you talk, do you talk about it? What, how That's does... a great question. We talked about it from the beginning. I was like, I am not having sex before I'm married, and I don't know if you're the guy or not, but that's just the way it's gonna be. We talked about that from the beginning. And then I told him we need a spiritually healthy community around us, mentoring us so good. to keep us accountable and to just keep us in prayer. And so that was like the next step we took, was we took a couple of our good, respected, friends and had dinner with them so so <laughs> yeah. good yeah so then 
talk to me about um, how it felt for you, Alex, coming in, because you shared earlier that your past looked very different. Right. Yeah. And I have heard that from people, whether it's the male or the female, mm -hmm. they're almost afraid sometimes of starting a new relationship and, and the stress of, I want it to be honorable. You had a very high standard and you knew clearly what you right. wanted, but did that feel like, I know that's what you wanted to, but it, did it feel like pressure to you? It didn't because I felt like it was the final step that I needed because I was talking then about my journey throughout my 20s of trying to discover how to be a man and then now becoming a man of faith. It was the final step for God to say, if you can do this, then I can use you. But I need Perfect. you, I need you to understand that this is much more than just a relationship. Like I'm working in your heart. Mm -hmm. Like I'm mm -hmm. actually reshaping yeah. it into where I need it to be. So like not only, yes, you're going to, find the woman that I have for you, but together, and this goes you know, going back to the healthy boundaries, together you guys are going to be used in a way that I could have never used you mm. by yourself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. To say that you're not going to have sex before marriage is a really great, honorable thing. Yes. But it, without, without a plan, oh. it doesn't work. Absolutely. So what's yeah. your plan? What are your boundaries? How are you going to make sure that doesn't happen? Well, we got engaged. So that's part of it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> well, I think, I think it's, it's a huge part of it because you have to understand, well, what's this thing going to look like? So we set a plan of this is, um, this is where we want to be and this is where we want to end up because this is how God intends this relationship to be. So we first said, okay, we, we need to, if, if we're going to do this, we're going to stand off until we get married. We need to get engaged and then start creating a plan. So that's one. And then two is one thing that we do is we pray with each other every single night. And what that does is it allows us to feel as if we're inviting God every night into our relationship. So and it, it's able, so whether we're angry, whether we're, you know, we're, we're feeling any other type of way, allowing God into our relationship on a nightly basis allows those boundaries to say, no, God, like we're living for you. We're not living for each other. So we don't make it about each other. Mm -hmm. And if yeah. we understand that, we understand that, you know, regardless of my past, like God can use me totally. in the relationship that I have now. Like I feel, and like knowing that I was her first kiss and everything, it's, yes, there's some pressure, but it's a good kind of pressure. It's almost what I needed in order to set this right. Cause like I lived in the world and I did all that stuff and it got me nowhere. So mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like I know that there's an empty feeling behind it. So I'm not necessarily tempted to do any of that stuff because it led me su down such a broken road. Okay. Is there some things that you won't do? Like, I'm not going to be in this place at this time, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm, I'd say our approach is more of like purity as a direction, which is a phrase that I have struggled with in the past. Like I'd heard people say like, it's a direction that you choose to take. And I was like, I think that's f full of BS basically. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. And then I was in a relationship but like, no, it is like a direction. Like right. you guys know which direction you're going physically. Like mm -hmm. you know which direction. And so you choose to go the opposite direction mm -hmm. and you have to choose to go the opposite direction like together. Yeah. And you know, I think that one of the things that we prioritize is making sure our relationship isn't completely about us. Like we try, you know, we serve at church. We make sure so that good. we are pouring into other people and that it's not about us. I think that's actually one of the greatest keys I would give every single couple. Whenever a couple, especially, because I think when you get engaged, it gets better, but it gets harder in some ways too, yeah. because you get very, you're more emotionally connected. But when you get exclusive, now you are in a dangerous territory. But if mm -hmm. it stays open and it's not just about us, now it's a bigger oh, wow. picture and it's healthy. Cool. I love awesome. this. Alex, Tiffany, you guys are awesome. You thank are. you so, so much oh, for, so much for coming yeah, and you. visiting us today, sharing yeah. your stories about healthy boundaries. I know it's gonna touch so many people out there. Now stay tuned because we have more sex, love, and relationships after the break. Welcome back to Sex, Love, and Relationships. We've had so many questions sent to us about the topics we're discussing, so we decided to send out a camera crew to capture this one for you. Hey, Pastor John and Helen. So, my parents have been married for 22 years, and it makes me wonder, do healthy relationships show the ability to reciprocate? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> What's your thoughts on this so one? I'm do guess... healthy relationships show the ability to reciprocate? Yeah, so is he most likely to have one as well? 
So well, you know, I think what. that's a great question that we can assume because we've seen a healthy relationship, which is such a gift mm -hmm. to have that with your parents. And we can assume that we've seen it, so that's what we're going to have. Yeah. And, and actually, our story is very different to that. My parents and John's parents were both married for 57 years. So we saw longevity in marriage, yet when we were married, married for four years, I was leaving my marriage. I was done. I was wow. like heartbroken. Wow. I was devastated. And it wasn't because there was infidelity. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because there was any level of abuse, but we had really grown apart. Wow. John was busy with building his career, building all these other things. I was at home with the babies. We forgot to take care of each other. Yeah. Life had gotten very complicated, and then we started to become quite antagonistic to each other. And I found myself in a position where John had already moved up 100, 350 miles away. I'm at home, you know, dealing with the children, and I decided I'm not moving up there. Mm. I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. And uh, I just could not imagine the pain of carrying on in this brokenness. And so I just decided that's it. And yet in that place, in my with a broken heart, is where I had to decide. I still remember... Um, praying one day and hearing God say, Helen, this is not the life I created wow. you for. And I couldn't stay there. I had to get up and make a decision. Well, if this isn't it, I know there's something different. I had seen better, but I had to do the work. It just didn't happen automatically just because my parents made it work. Wow. So in that place where you were at the bottom yep. um, and it was easier not to, yeah. to move up to... to Ugh, I just couldn't bear the thought of leaving everything that felt familiar at home mm -hmm. to going into kind of the unknown with a, such a broken marriage and, and raising children in that environment. So I had to come to God. Wow. And I remember hitting my knees one night. I had tucked two beautiful little girls in bed, three mm. years old, two years old, looked at my very big pregnant stomach. I was ready to give birth in about six weeks. Wow. And I thought, what have I done? Wow. And I got on my knees, got before God, and, sa and I said, I've had life with you, and I've had life without you, and I'm not going to do this anymore. And I had to get up from that place mm -hmm. and start rebuilding my life. Wow. And even though John was living 350 miles away, God was doing a work in my heart and changing me, giving me a fresh new vision. But it took this a lot of work. Awesome. It, do it doesn't happen just because we've seen it. Well, now, my question is to you. Is, do you have to learn how to, you know, how to, you know, navigate a good marriage so like someone who's single like myself do we do we learn how to you know be a wife or how to you know navigate a marriage or what yeah. have you or is more you know caught than taught so you know from our parents growing up do we do we catch it are we expected just to know because we had a healthy family at home or do we need to be taught this is what a marriage is you know like this is what you do what do you what do you say such to that? a great question i think you need both I think that you absolutely, I have learned love and how to take care of each other from my parents. But just because I saw them do it, every marriage is unique. And so John wasn't my dad and I wasn't my mom. We had to figure it out for each other. So you can have some tools, but you're going to have to use those tools to work in, our, in your relationship. So just because you saw it is no guarantee. Yeah, so when you were at the good. bottom, what was the things you that actually because of your parents and what you you know grew up with that reciprocated or 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 the vision that came up inside of you that you knew this isn't me I, I can't stay here you've seen something yeah, that did. you can't unsee well, I do remember saying what would my mom do yeah. if she was here because I hadn't told anybody I was just so disappointed in me and so disappointed in John that I had pulled away from everybody. But in that moment of desperation, I did think, what would my mom do? And I knew wow. she'd get up and fight. But she wouldn't just fight in her own strength. She would fight the good fight of faith. Yeah. She would turn to God and let God rebuild her marriage. I saw her do it, actually. I saw my mom do that herself. And it was in that place, yeah, that I thought... I needed to do it with God, but my mom had given me a gorgeous display of mm. faith. And I think that that's true in my marriage also with our children as they've navigated their relationship. I think they've learned great tools from John and I, but the bottom line is every one of them have had to do the work for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that we can have the vision, but we still have to do the work. But once we've done the work, now look at the other side of it. Yeah. There are thousands that have got a vision mm -hmm. from what we did doing the work. So the answer is, does the, what your parents 
did for you, does that re mm. reciprocate? Yes, mm. it does, but it doesn't excuse you yeah. from doing the work. And it doesn't limit you if you haven't seen it. You yeah, can go and good. find it, and yeah, you still have good. to do the now work. Now, you're saying the vision. How do you get the vision? If you're someone who didn't have a healthy model at home, and but you desire to get married, and but you just don't know, well, I just want a great marriage, the ones that look like they have on TV and, the, the, you know, the movies. <laughs> right. But how do you get... How do you learn to know what that looks like yeah. and to keep it healthy and long-lasting? I think you have to hang around people that do have that. And I think there's something inside of you that is drawn to it. It's almost mm. like there's something that resonates on the inside of you. When you get around what you want, something comes yeah. alive. Mm -hmm. And you need to be sensitive to that. Listen to your heart That's and good. recognize that, that you, there's no replacement for vision. You need to build that vision on the inside of you of what you want. And the more you hang around those people, the clearer that vision gets. But like Helen said... So this vision, you're saying what you want means meaning to so get a vision of what you want in a marriage right in a husband right or with in a wife okay yeah. awesome, awesome. Yeah. I'm loving this. but it doesn't excuse you from you still have to do the work Ooh. Yeah. yeah and, and what work what work <laughs> what does that mean what work helen well i think a lot of the work is i think it's important like for someone like you you're a single woman a gorgeous single woman and 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 doing the work at this season of your life is the most critical work mm. of not just a rule i want him to be this tall i want him to make this much money but what are the non-negotiables in my wow. life and and but before we can have that expectation on another person mm -hmm. a man in your case you would you would say what what can I bring to the marriage? What Very, can I do yeah. to grow and develop? What is my dream? I want to be. I want to love this way and be awesome. loved this way. I, you know, what are important things to me? And I think that when you build that vision on the inside mm -hmm. of you, because your marriage, whoever you marry, it's not going to be like anybody else's. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we want a marriage just like that. Don't want a marriage just like anybody else's. Let God form that on the inside of mm -hmm. you, and then and let it develop into what it is. Because ours isn't like anyone else. We never knew our marriage would look like this. We've evolved into this, but it's because we discovered who each other is. But there were absolutely some keys we've built with. Yeah, I think that the work it starts with yourself. Yes. Wow. <laughs> you gotta. So don't see. just lay around and just. Wait, Absolutely. You know, drops in, but you some you got to see what you want in the future, and then work on you to become yes, that part that's of key. what you want. And you'll attract that that guy into your world. But it is really a responsibility. See it, and then you got to do the work to become that. Yeah. Oh, I love this. I love this. You guys are awesome. So much godly wisdom. Well, after the break, we enter into the world of social media and begin discussing what's trending online. You're not going to want to miss this. Welcome Stick back around. to the show. Now, this is a very interesting segment because we can't deny the impact of social media on our lives. Let's see how we can decipher the Matrix conversations on the social media scene. Let's check it out. Whoops, she sent me a semi-naked, oh my goodness, semi-naked image of herself on my iPhone. It's wow. sad, but that is not that unusual wow. these days, is it? Especially among the younger generation. Yeah. The millennials. Well, what do you do? I mean, I'm, I'm embarrassed for her. I'm like, yeah. oh, dear girl, please don't do that. Yeah. Well, I think that there is this kind of, um, like, their eyes are blinded in some ways to really understand what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I think it's become so normal in this selfie world that it's like, well, it's just a picture, and he won't show it to anybody else, and it's okay. It's not like we're having sex or anything. Yeah. I just showed him a picture of my breasts. Mm -hmm. And and suddenly it takes on a whole different life. First of all, mm -hmm. that isn't appropriate behavior. Yeah. You need to think more of yourself than mm -hmm. to do something like that. I wouldn't even do it as a married woman. I'm mm -hmm. just thinking, I don't know who'll get that iPhone. It would be a dumb <laughs> idea. But um, um, I think that there is a bit of a naivety and yeah. a deception with young people today. Yeah. And not just young people. I'm about we to say, know not just young, doing it. Yeah, <laughs> not just young people. But to, you know, what would you say to women? If you could say that one thing to women who might, you know, well, I want him to, you know, desire me, you know what I'm uh, saying? So I'm going to show oh. a little bit more leg than normal and he's going to, you know, chase after me more. What would you say to kind of squash that whole... <laughs> Years ago, I was speaking at a, a teenage outside festival there was thousands and thousands of them there and uh, and I, and I was just noticing that the the, the dress of, of the girls and and I know you want him to see you it's actually part of the hormone structure mm -hmm. of a girl estrogen is the thing that that mm -hmm. you know I want him to notice me yeah. it makes a big difference you know so I, I I said I know you want that honey but he hasn't seen your face yet <laughs> 
Come on. Come really, on. if that's all he's looking at, that's, and, and actually the way that men are wired mm -hmm. is we will see that. You know, mm -hmm. the Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. The bottle, the original yeah. bottle. There was a reason already. it was shaped like that. But what do you say to men who get the text? So the the man just got the text and he's like, whoa, okay, should I look? Should I, should I delete? What do you say to them? Actually, guys, you, you, you need to understand yourself and know, you know, enough to know that looking at that is not going to get you what you want. And girls need to understand that showing him is not going to get you what you want. Come on. Because he's... He wants to actually pursue that that woman that he he thinks is worth the pursuit. And actually the pursuit is what's going to bond him to that woman, not her being easy. So he needs to just shut it down. So as soon as he sees it, just shut it down. Does he say something to her? I, so. I would let her know that, you know, I don't appreciate that. Ooh. I don't know. I just think it's, yeah, it's negative. That's what he should do. It's negative in our world today, and both yeah. sides need to know it's not going to get them what they want. Come on, preach, Pastor. Come on. Let's see what's next. You know you're single. You know you're a single dude when your remotes have their own side of the bed. <laughs> okay, I look at that. I read that. I'm like, dude, what are you complaining about? You're single because you choose to be single. So if your remotes are on the other side of the bed, Go out and find, you know, a good thing. A man who finds a wife finds a good thing, right? right. So you better get out there, you know what I'm saying? So what do you, what's your take on this? Well... That sounds about right. It, that sounds about right. It sounds like a guy who is not motivated. He's laying in bed watching Netflix or the Sporting <laughs> Channel. I just go there. Go watching there. Watching the go Sporting Channel it. and uh, doesn't have the motivation to go out there and... You know, or would, watching channels that he, this, that he really shouldn't be well, watching. Well, that too, perhaps. You know, because exactly, they're out there. Exactly, exactly. Now, would you say this? Because the women, you know, we're taught, especially as a Christian woman, we're just to sit back, you know, look pretty, read our word, you know? So, and then he'll come and find us. So a lot of us women are thinking, you know, like, well, we're waiting to be, you know, you know, pursued and sought after, you know what I'm saying? Yep. So we're not single necessarily by choice. Yep. But a guy, if you're single, you're single by choice. You need to get out there, you know what I'm saying? Would you say that? Oh, Can I say this? Yeah. I answer this question. What is the most asked question we get globally? All the women asking. Where are all the good men? <laughs> Boom. They're at home, obviously, well, with, with the remote, their remote control. What's and, the deal? No, yeah. I don't believe that. I, but. I think we got a major problem in our world today, mm -hmm. and there is no easy answer. But I often say the answer is mothers. <laughs> you know, there's really great wow. men, but, but, most, but, but, but a lot of them are still in seed form. They're called boys. Ooh. And they need to be raised up to be Ooh. men, and that's a boy. Well, what's the problem? That's Why? a boy. Okay. He hasn't, so then... he hasn't actually taken responsibility. He's a man, and if you're responsible, you, you go and there find the woman. There we go, but you... where's the disconnect? You're saying that they're still boys. Why aren't they being raised up to be men? Where are we going wrong here? Uh, there's, there's been an aim that the enemy's aim is on the family, and within the yeah. family, his yeah. aim is on yeah. the man. Yeah, and, yeah. And, right. and we need to show Come those on. those boys. And anyway, So much of what we see picture. today in reality is a very father society yeah. there is an 100%. absenteeism with 100%. fathers there's many many amazing men but I do think that there is a huge vacuum yeah. in the role of fathers so we need to see these men rise up know who they are and Come not on. be afraid to engage the will the Preach. world and take it on so I agree with that man now after the break we welcome in our studio audience who has some great questions for John and Helen you're not going to want to go anywhere stay with us Well, welcome back to the show, and welcome to our studio audience who have some great questions ready for John and Helen on the topics of sex, love, and relationships. John and Helen, welcome. Great to Thanks. be with you. You guys are ready? Here. I think our studio has. audience is ready. <laughs> yeah. They got some good ones. Helen's Perfect. ready. She has the answers. Come on. <laughs> our first question today. In a marriage, how do you best bring up financial struggles in that discussion about budgeting, debt, overspending? Things oh. like that. <laughs> well, that a, is a loaded a question. question. No. We sure walk through this. Yeah, I, I think financial pressure is one of the worst pressure there is. And because typically um, everybody feels like I'm the problem. It's, you know, I'm to blame. And as soon as you bring it up, it's like you're pointing a finger at me. You're accusing me. And somehow, you know, we, we often talk about having a tough 
conversation and how to do it. Somehow you've got to walk around the boxing ring instead of against each other. You've got to walk around the thing, put your arm around your spouse and um, identify what the issue is and then the two of you come up with an answer to it. So I think the way to do that is to start off, listen honey, we're going to talk about something that's really touchy and I want you to know ahead of time, I am not pointing a finger, it's not your problem, my problem, but together I believe we can really, you know, so set it up ahead of time mm -hmm. so that you're not mm -hmm. feeling like you're against each other because wow, the walls come up high, and we know that personally. Yeah, because, I mean, we've gone through the really starving student days and really had nothing, and I would feel guilty, and John never once made me feel guilty for spending it, but somehow I felt because I wasn't out there earning a degree, it must, uh, it all rested on me, so. And, and by the way, she <laughs> never was the problem. But she always, as soon as we, we brought it up, oh, you took it personally, didn't I you? I did, I did. I felt like I was contributing to it, that I, because I wasn't earning money. For me, it was a difficult thing. But when John's, what John just said is so true. It's, it, in a marriage, it's us. And, and how do we take care of this? And I think often in, in marriage, we come at finances from a very different place. Maybe we grew up with lots or grew up with little, and it's our mindset, because there is a really a strong financial mindset. And it's learning how to understand each other and learning that we have to have a plan. And I think with finances, we always have to believe it's going to get better. But how is that going to happen? It's not by spending more. It's by taking care of what we do have and stewarding it well. And, and we've had to, you know, we've had seasons in our married life where we've had to go back at it. What's the plan to get to where we want to go? And, and we always found excited, even if it meant we had to pull back spending a lot, we were on the same team, we had a goal, yeah. and together we achieved it. It's, um, it's amazing, a plan. Come up with a plan and then take two steps in the right direction and all of a sudden the sky's blue yeah. and there's no problem. We can deal with this. Yeah, fantastic question though. It would be one of the greatest stresses in any marriage is financial stress. Wow. What's our next question? Hi, for a child that wants to pursue their dreams, what is um, a parent's role and the kid's role so that no one feels kind of guilt for someone moving away or okay. like that? So you're pursuing dreams and, and feeling a little bit like maybe that's uh, hard for your parents to deal with. Yeah, pretty common. I think that that's... Um, Parents want the best for their children. I think most parents want the best for your children. I'm guessing that would be true of your parents. But I think that sometimes there is this sense of guilt if I'm leaving. I, I would hope that if I was a parent, because our children are all close by, our grandchildren are all close by, so we have this ideal world in my mind. But I would hope that as a parent, that if my child had an opportunity or a massive dream, that I would get behind their dream. Because I would, I think God puts dreams in, in children children's hearts and my children's hearts and maybe they'd feel a call to another country or to do something else or I would want to be a part of them achieving their dreams but I think it takes communication that it's not like I'm t pulling away from you I think some parents feel like they're pulling away because they're not happy with me and I think it's as much of an insecurity sometimes for ch parents as it is for the children but I think always move towards the relationship and move towards communication um, as a child I would hope my child would tell me well this is happening for me I'm so excited about these opportunities I'm growing in this way and then as a parent we feel like wow Wow, our child feels fulfilled but but everything that we can do to take away the tension of we're pulling away from each other other rather than we're moving towards dreams and if my dreams fulfilled then your dream as a parent is fulfilled as well the way I would approach your parents I would approach them by patting them on the back and praising them mm. and giving them a credit for who you are and why you want to pursue your dream yeah, it's good if it wasn't for the your great parenting and you put you 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 taught me you raised me to follow the dreams in my heart and so you build them up and if if you do that right it becomes wow my child is moving on looking mm -hmm. you know following the dream because I've been a great parent That's which amazing. is true isn't it but sometimes mm -hmm. because they don't see it that way they, they feel like they're moving away because I didn't do it right you know I'm gonna be missing them yeah you're gonna miss them and all the rest but when you know it's because you're you've done a great job as a parent I saw that even with my parents when I started pastoring a church it wasn't the church I was raised in and and they at first were like well this is so hard on me we must have done a bad job and da 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 so 
I just began to tell him, thank you for all that you've done. If it wasn't for you and what I learned growing up and, and, and I want to pursue God because of the way you raised me, I'd never be doing this. But because you raised me so amazing, I've just pursued God and, and I'm, I find myself in a place so amazing and rich. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's the key, I think. So I have a friend who is married, and they just recently found out that their spouse has an addiction to pornography and are just trying to navigate that. So wondering what kind of advice you have for that. Wow. Yeah. I think that this is such a common situation in so many marriages, and it's not just a male problem or a female problem anymore. There is huge addiction in the area of pornography, and, and it really does come in when it comes into marriage, it, I mean, it's never healthy, obviously, for anyone. But in marriage, it robs from our intimacy and our relationship. And so I, if she's just found it out or he's just found it out, I think the first thing to do is in a place of not accusing and anger, which is going to be incredibly hard, but to actually say we need to talk about this because if this is going on, it affects both of us and get help. Further to that, one thing that I feel very important, I'm just going to say this hypothetically, that if John had a porn addiction, I would want to know about it. I would want to know that he's getting help. I would want him to be accountable, but I would not want him to be accountable to me. I would want to have somebody I really trusted as a mentor, say another pastor, someone that I know is in John's business and holding him accountable and that 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 I know that it's going in the direction it needs to go to get freedom. And if he wasn't, then I would trust this mentor to say, I'm going to sit you both down. John's not doing the work. And what is the plan from here? Because I think in marriage, when, when there is um, to really go forward, if you feel like you have to be the one policing every, like every day, it's like they're picking up their phone or they're turning on the computer and they're freaking out every single time thinking, is this it again? Is it happening again? How do we ever move forward? Yeah. And I think that's where you invite someone else. Honesty is the only way. You have to bring it into the light. And, uh, and once you bring it in the light, you can trust God to come into the middle of it and get help. But if that was us, that's what I would hope would happen. And the thing again, remember, every addiction is fueled by guilt and shame. And so the worst thing, actually the enemy is guilt and shame. If you can just take that out of the mix, you can work with how yeah. do we retrain your thinking, whatever it is, to get on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. Wow, such godly wisdom. Thank you so much for sharing. These questions are really sparking some crucial conversations. We thank you so much. Now, right after the break, John and Helen outline their final messages on the topics of healthy boundaries in relationships. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the show where we cover everything surrounding sex, love, and relationships. Now, I know we talked a lot about love, and I know we talked a lot about relationships, but we haven't really gotten into uh, sex. And I can't believe I'm saying that word on TV, sex. But before we go there, we couldn't resist asking our studio audience members if they would reveal their own insights on sex, love, and relationships for John and Helen. Let's take a look. What are your first words in the morning? Why did I go to bed so late? Why do you think good people cheat? Possibly they're not focused in their relationship with God. What do you do if you like someone? Stalk their Instagram. You think sexting's okay? Um, if you're married, What's a symbol of being in love? Sacrifice. Do you think opposites can attract? Yes. Should you text someone right back? Yes, unless you're trying to play hard to get. Do you think flirting is cheating? I would say so. If you could ask a woman one question, what would it be? I'm not sure. Is being friends with your ex okay? Um, I think it depends on the situation and if you're, whoever you're with is comfortable with it or not. <laughs> oh, wow. this is some good stuff right here. Yeah, I, I don't know about stalking her on let me tell you Instagram. Something. He's being honest. He's being so honest. Uh, yeah. I absolutely love that because people do that nowadays. Whether it's, you know, girl, guy, doesn't matter. You do that to another girl just because you want to know what they're about or <laughs> new friendships or what have you. Everybody yeah. stalks each other's Instagrams, sure they do. Their Even Facebooks. if you're, yeah, that's just kind of... 
Wow. Don't tell me I mean, you've you, you never want, listen, done that. You Checked want to do that. I think Instagram. that's one of the biggest things that you do. They Google people nowadays. So you have to get their whole credit history. You need to know everything, OK? I've uh, never Googled anybody. Or stalked any. Well, I'm sorry. Is, is, is that like I'm I'm really you're, you're behind the time? Is there anything you're behind. you feel you're like confessing? Behind. You seriously have never Googled something like checking somebody out? No, I I I would Google somebody if I was meeting somebody. I didn't know who they were. I wanted to know their face, but oh. to check them, I no. That's because you're, you're 63 and I'm only 60. I know, 60. I'm really, really, <laughs> and you're really old-fashioned now. But nowadays, something. nowadays, no. if you wanted to date someone or you like someone, I mean, the first thing you go to is the Instagram. If, if, what, if my granddaughter starts dating somebody that I haven't met, you know I'm going to their Instagram. Just going to put it out there. 100%. Yeah. It says so much about you, <laughs> and I think that's the fastest way to kind of get to know someone, what they like, what they don't like, and All what right, they're I'm about. I'm learning something. Social Thank media. You. Thank you. I'm stalking you from now on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to do a little remix here. We're going to throw in some questions about sex, some questions that you guys had. Now, one of the questions that were actually written to us was, I had a baby a little over a year ago, and I wasn't interested in sex for a long time. But now that I am, my husband is pushing me away. Help. Wow. Ooh. Can Ooh. I tell you, do you remember I many years ago, remember. we had a question so similar to this. Actually, I remember a woman called into our television program. She it wasn't, was live. The show yeah, was live. And she began to weep. And wow. she was saying how um, during, you know, like before she got pregnant and, and during pregnancy, she was loved sex. But now after she had the baby, she was completely focused on the baby. And her husband had wanted to come back and have sexual relations. And, and she said she pushed him away for almost a year. And she was sobbing because she said, now I so want him in my life, but I feel like he doesn't want me. Wow. And I don't know where he went with that. I, I, I think she was afraid. Like, is, is he? That's complete? what I'm, I thought. I'm like, yeah. if he's not getting it from her, who's he getting it from? That's yeah, my thought process. That's, that's you know? one of the issues that this brings up, you know. Um, so we could talk to him and, and, you know, try and, you know, straighten him out. But the other issue is just to recognize that there is this physiological thing that happens, the seasons that happens. And when a woman, after a woman has a baby, she's in a season where she's not... Um, excited about sex. Sometimes it's even painful in, you know, to go there. But that's where I think talking about this, even on a show like this, mm -hmm. or talking about this in church, in, in, in marriage, you know, some kind of context where people get the facts that this is normal, okay, but what she has to, under, you know, understand is for him to still want sex is normal too. And when you get married, you actually own each other's sexuality in terms of it's your responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so he shouldn't be pushing her, but at the same time, she should, you know, there's, there's, there's some ways that you can, yeah. you can go through this that hopefully you don't get to that place. I'm not saying she's wrong or he's wrong. Well, what about I'm the saying, pushback but now? Now. now she's here. Yeah. I think it needs to have a true heartfelt conversation yeah. of saying, um, I'm taking responsibility for, for, for my end and what needs to happen. Sometimes there's medical reasons. Sometimes there's yeah. um, postpartum. There might be a number of reasons. And I think it's important to evaluate that. And so without having this person in the room to co have a conversation about what actually happened, to understand sometimes there are extenuating circumstances. But all of that said, I think we have to be comfortable talking about our sexual relationship with the person we're married to. Mm -hmm. And 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 going there and so often when we feel like we failed the hardest person mm -hmm. to talk to is the one that we feel like we've let down but the husband is giving the pushback and not often do you hear that this time the husband is saying no I'd go into a state of kind of fear now like well what happened before you yeah. you were you were you know yep. running after it now you're kind of like no I'm good they can get really hurt, too. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't mean necessarily he's out there involved in pornography or having sex with other people. Sometimes it's a bit of a, you know what, you did this to me, I'm doing this to you. So I, think, I, I don't think we can assume anything other than there has to be a conversation. What's going on? I apologize. I apologize. Let's work on this and build a great future together. And sometimes you need a counselor in the middle of it to yeah. just help you navigate it. Yeah, get help. Yeah, yeah, that's some good advice. That's yeah. some great advice. Oh, Pastor yeah. John, talk to us about today. Wrap today up, the episode today. What would you say about Thank you. today? 
great show today, really talking about boundaries and how important boundaries are and this amazing couple that we interviewed and, and them recognizing that they need to have boundaries. Helen and I have built boundaries into our life and people sometimes say, but you're married, you've been married for 42 years, that's why we have boundaries. It takes one second to, to blow it all. Trust takes a lifetime to build and a second to smash yeah. and it becomes so valuable mm -hmm. that you want to make sure yeah. you don't go down the wrong yeah. road. Now here's the thing, most people think that they can deal with it, they can handle it, they can fight the temptation. Why would you want to fight the temptation? Why would you want to waste energy fighting temptation? Mm -hmm. A better way is stay away from it. A better way is to run from temptation, which is what the Bible teaches. Yeah. And the way you do that is you build boundaries in your life. Personally, I will never be caught in a room with another woman by ourselves other than Helen. I, uh, I, I won't be on the phone talking for any length of time. I won't be allowing myself to build a, an emotional so connection with on. anyone else other than Helen. I love other people, but I love our marriage, and I'm no good to them so good. if I destroy our marriage. So we have boundaries, and I think you need to have them. So sit down, talk, build those boundaries. Ooh, this is good. We can preach. Come on, Pastor. <laughs> yes, thank you so, so much, Pastor John and Helen, for all your wisdom, all your godly insight. I'm loving this. Now, you know, of course, we all love the funny parts of, of our show, but we also are aware that these are real issues with real people that are dealing with them. Now, if you're concerned about a friend or family member or even yourself regarding the topic of healthy boundaries, we encourage you to reach out and to talk to someone. Now, until then... Be blessed, live large, and go with God.